Industrial heat is a big problem. It needs to be really, really hot, often around 1500 degrees centigrade. Industries that need this much heat include petrochemicals, cement, and pulp and paper. Industry is Canada's largest energy consumer, accounting for 53% of total end-use energy, which is provided mostly by natural gas. But this is no longer just a climate issue. Finding a way to create low emissions, low-cost, reliable industrial heat is increasingly an, economically, uh, an economic competitive issue. Electrify Thermal Solutions thinks it has a fix. I spoke to CEO Dan Stack about its novel technology that uses waste wind and solar power. Welcome to the interview, Dan. Thanks, great to be here. I remember, it wasn't that long ago, we were talking about hydrogen as maybe being a storage for excess wind and solar. Uh, you know, we would store it underground in salt caverns or something. But thermal storage using uh, bricks has really, I don't know, it's emerged uh, in the last couple of years. At least that's the way I, I perceive it. And that's what your company does. What's your take on the general market and application of, of this thermal storage technology uh, in the U.S. and Canada? Yeah, so... You know, certainly there's been a lot more attention recently and, and we're, you know, in the thick of it here at Electrified Thermal um, on thermal energy storage and the potential for that. And you mentioned storing heat in bricks. People are storing heat in bricks or rocks or other things. We do use a form of bricks uh, at our company. And, you know, what we see as far as potential, you know, in the U.S., in Canada, you know, globally, in fact, but, you know, each country is a little different. Generally, though, what we see is that electricity to heat um, and storing that heat for later, that is among, you know, it really is, you can't get simpler than that as far as uh, simplicity and cost effectiveness on delivering heat uh, to industry or other applications, right? Electricity to heat is a very simple physics, and it allows you to, if you do it right, hit very high temps and to store it in very low cost materials. And so, you mentioned hydrogen as an example that has some extra steps of, you know, uh, if you're, say, trying to split water to make hydrogen or other things, there's other sources of losses. Uh, you have to consider how to contain the hydrogen and other things like this, maybe transport the hydrogen. Here we're talking about, you know, electricity in, converting the heat directly into a material, and then just blowing air or some other gas through the system to get out high temperature gas, right? Flowing it through your stack of bricks or whatever else. And so you can't get simpler and you can't get kind of more cost effective than that approach for it is what we've seen, uh, certainly in our end. Um, one of the uh, uh, advantages, it seems to me here, is that it, it enables the this new emerging view of energy, which is, uh, first of all, we're talking electricity. So uh, in the past, it was really important on a grid to match supply and demand. You generate it only as much as you need it. So those, you know, the, when you flick the switch, the light always came on. But now there's this idea coming. It's like, you know, people like Tony Siba and, and Kingsmill Bond at, at Ember. These folks are saying, produce as much low-cost electricity as you can, and folks will figure out how to use the surplus. That you just can't, you know, as we approach the marginal cost of zero for a unit of electricity, you can't produce enough of it. We'll figure it out. And I don't know, what, what's your take on that? I mean, absolutely, you know, and I think thermal storage is a big part of that, of course, where, you know, if you had, there is, you know, cheap and free electricity today, even, you know, on the market that is being wasted um, at this moment, right? And that's because I would say, you know, certainly the signals are there and people are trying to address it, make use of it because it's an opportunity. Um, and so I think part of figuring it out means getting lower and lower capex approaches um to harness that you know uh zero or, or near zero marginal price electricity um and, and certainly right that's the nature of how we're going to tackle kind of our our energy situation and our climate change situation um if we're going to harness renewable energy or other assets that don't like to load follow right the ability to soak it up in abundance at a low you know capex uh, approach is how we can, you know, we will find a way to use it. We will find a way to deliver it uh, at large. 
One of the things that I found interesting about your technology is uh, you claim that it's easily integrated with existing uh, fossil fuel fired furnaces uh, and the fossil fuel would be mostly uh, natural gas. Um, why is that important and how do you go about doing that? Yeah, I mean, for us, we would say it's among the most important things for this, uh, the transition we're looking at, right? And so when we talk about, if you have all these pieces together, you have the low price electricity that's available, that's abundant, it is the best energy source to use if you can use it, right? What we see right now is heavy industry kind of being locked out of using this low value energy, Um, uh, low price energy, we'll say, they can deliver high value with it, of course. Um, and that's because what we're trying to address here in the market that we see as the shortcoming is there's no convenient, reliable way to use it. Um, and so when we talk about integrating directly into industry, what they really want at the end is, you know, heat that is hot, very, you know, high temperatures. They want it to be cheap, which we already mentioned that, you know, we are at those prices electrically. and they want it to be practical, which means meeting them where they are, right? Integrating into their furnace, their boiler, their kiln, or right now they usually have a burner, right? A natural gas burner, shooting a flame in there. And if you wanna plug into that kind of process without radically redesigning it, you need to be able to come in at high temps um, and whatever they do, do downstream of that, right? If you come in at a similar temp or a similar, you know, kind of footprint to what a burner does, then you've actually given them something they can work with conveniently. Anything short of that, there's more and more, you know, ramifications you got to look at is, you know, does this do my job actually or not? So by, you know, one of our differentiators is that we are at these higher temps and by delivering those higher temps from electrified thermals, uh, dual high thermal battery, you know, that product allows them to plug in more conveniently the electrified heating uh, system than, what else is on the market today. Let's talk about your company and um, your technology because you you were a spin out from MIT in in uh, 2020 and you've developed this dual hive thermal battery. Can you explain that please? Absolutely. So, and this has been a focus point of mine since it's over 10 years now. Uh, so it's it's been a while. Um, yeah, I started at MIT in 2014 and I actually, I had gone there to try to build the future of nuclear power. I was uh, in the nuclear department, but I ended up actually working on how to heat bricks up electrically. It wasn't the most, uh, you know, enthusiastic or invigorating idea when I got there. In hindsight, it was among the most highest impact and exciting things I could have been doing. So I'm very thankful. Um, but, you know, the question of how do we take electricity from non-load following assets or renewable assets that are intermittent, take that electricity and turn it into an on-demand heat source. Uh, that was the question we had even back in 2014. And what we kind of learned at that time was that today's electric heating systems, uh, they were never really designed to do this in massive bulks amounts that would be able to replace fossil fuels, right? They were never conceived to replace fossil fuels. Um, and why would they be, right? It didn't really make sense to try and replace fossil fuels or, or, you know, harness electricity for bulk fossil fuel heating jobs until fossil fuels uh, and electricity came to similar prices. We have electricity now being generated at these incredibly cheap prices. You have the environmental aspects as well. And so what we worked on back then and what ultimately spun out to become electrified thermal solutions and, and the dual thermal battery, our product offering, is we looked at the best ways to electrically heat uh, to flame temperatures with reliable materials for decades, because that's what industry really needs. And so we looked at fire bricks. These are materials that are, these are oxide bricks that are ubiquitous in industry. They are used to running at flame temps for decades. And we, my, my research was on making those materials electrically conductive. So we basically made bricks electrically conductive um, but they're otherwise, they're 99% the same, essentially 98% the same of the existing bricks. Um, and so that's what fills the dual thermal battery and what allows us to run at high temps for decades um, and last longer than other electric heating uh, systems. So that's really what we bring to the table um, 
with the dual high thermal battery. And that's kind of the arc of, of how we got here today in brief terms. So if I understand this correctly, your innovation was to make fire bricks able to conduct electricity through them. That then heats them up and then it gets stored in an insulated container. And when you need the heat, then you, as you mentioned earlier, you blow air or gas through it and uh, voila, you've got, I mean, it sounds like a really simple system to me. Yeah, I mean, that was certainly the idea, right? And and we have, you know, you mentioned storing heat in bricks. We've actually stored heat in bricks for, you know, a century or more um, in different industrial processes, usually storing waste heat. Um, you do it a lot in the glass industry and in the steel industry. They have things called fire brick regenerators that do this. We looked at that and we said, why not that but electric? Why can't we flow electricity straight through those bricks? What would that take? And that was kind of part of what, you know, On the other side, like we, we see how we store energy for later. Well, you know, we saw electric heaters integrated in there have some limitations. So what would it take to make bricks conducted that could just do both jobs at once? Um, and the goal was to be as simple as possible, to be as familiar as possible to what's already done in industry um, and what can be scaled well. These things are already built, actually, these large brick storage systems to capture this waste heat or, or waste combustible heat, you know, at the hundreds of megawatts. So, you know, yeah, as simple as possible was always one of the designing features there. Let's talk about some of the uh, industries that might use your technology. Can you give us some examples? Certainly. So, you know, we're talking right now, when we first started off, we were focusing on the highest temperature applications. We wanted to conceive of something that could do the cement, the steel, the glass and ceramics plants of the world that run at really high temps. Um, but even then, that even things that you might think of as not so high temp, like food and beverage products, right, or pulp and paper, you know, or even as anything that needs steam generation, which a lot of industrial plants do, a lot of this is running. It's still all combustion driven for the most part. And a lot of it's running at, you know, near a thousand C or more. Um, the hottest things are talking about 1500 Celsius or more. Um, our bricks can run at 1800 Celsius. Um, which is just about hot as flames. And so when we look at where we can plug in, we're talking about every major industrial vertical um, that kind of you could name. And it is a very universal problem, you know, for that reason, right? You know, everyone needs heat. And it's often not appreciated uh, today when we look at efforts to electrify or decarbonize. It's just how much heating need uh, we have that today, a solar panel or a wind turbine, it can't just produce that natively. You need an extra, you know, missing piece here. And that is a thermal battery or a good electric heating system. I'll, I'll go through some of the industries that you work on. Cement and steel manufacturing, glass and ceramics production, chemical processing, food and beverage industries, pulp and paper manufacturing. Those are the, the some obvious ones. Now, uh, the application that I have in mind, a lot of our readers uh, for, are familiar with the Canadian oil and gas industry, which means the Alberta oil sands. And they need uh, a lot of heat either on the, there's two processes, the steam assisted gravity drainage, where they pump heat into the underground and soften up the bitumen so it'll flow. Or the other one is they mine it and then they have to process it, which they use a lot of steam. And they have massive boilers and they're converting from pet coke to natural gas. But I mean, natural gas still is, is fairly, uh, it's not clean. It's just cleaner than coal. Um, this sounds to me like it would be a perfect application for, you know, making steam for an oil sands process. Certainly it could make the steam, you know, we can plug into basically any steam generator at any temperature or pressure. Um, and it can be a few megawatts or maybe hundreds of megawatts, maybe for one of these fields, uh, for what you might need for, for out there. Um, and, you know, we've talked to some folks, you know, who need these sizes for different, maybe not for the oil fields, but for different mining processes or even district heating systems that have massive steam needs. Um, and they, a lot of them are going to look similar. It's just a question of scale and temperature they need. And we talk at that level with, with those, uh, with those customers to make sure we develop the, the right size thermal battery and electric heating approach. Um, but certainly there's, you know, on steam, you know, we're prepared to do that today, essentially. What about, uh, uh, we'll wrap up the interview uh, with this question, uh, uh, Dan. 
how close are you to commercialization? Are you commercialized already or are you just in the process? Yeah, so where we are right now is we are hitting the megawatt scale this year with our demonstration system, turning online in the next few months here. And next year, we'll be on customer sites. So we're talking to a variety of industrials um, across the different spaces we mentioned. And so we are moving the ball well on that and basically making sure we show those specs out of our demonstration system this year. And these are talking about plants that could be anywhere from you know 5 megawatts to 15 megawatts. And that'd be a stepping stone for ultimately doing the many tens or hundreds of megawatts that a lot of these sites actually need. Um, but you can stay tuned as far as, uh, you know, more news on those deployments. But, you know, the step from our demonstrator to a commercial product, they are essentially the same thing. Um, so what we're doing is ready to go. I actually thought of one more question. Um, I understand that uh, the, the your system can be used to help power grids uh, by this kind of a demand response. Maybe you could explain that. Definitely. I mean, you know, we talked a lot about this low value electricity or fluctuating prices. I mean, what the grid is dealing with in that respect, right, is imbalances that can overload their system. They would love for the ability to have a flexible off taker because it actually allows the grid to run more efficiently and more cost effectively. And so, you know, what we see with um, thermal batteries is an ability to harmonize industrial, the industrial heating sector, which is a huge untapped sector um, with the grid itself so that the ability to turn that on and off for the grid is mutually beneficial, right? The, the industrial off ticker gets lower value electricity, lower price electricity, and the you know grid operator gets to solve some of their headaches on optimizing and, and running um, the grid. So we have had folks all in the room at the same time to talk about these uh, synergies. And it's definitely one of the more you know, appealing aspects of a system like ours, whereas other electrified systems that you see out there, a lot of them still want constant electric power, things that don't respond well to um, cyclic operations or, or intermittent operations of, of the realities of the grid today, right? Where we're deploying more solar and more wind, more no, uh, non-load following solutions like uh, nuclear or hydro. So flexibility is really valuable to the grid and the uh, off taker in this case. Well, again, this is really exciting, and as you say, there are a number of uh, of other companies in the in the space. It looks like it's ready to take off, and certainly there appears to be plenty of demand. So, thank you very much for this. Really appreciate your insights. Thanks, Markham. Appreciate it.